This throbbing bloblet here is something called a plasmodial slime mold. It's not some unusual thing either. If you've taken a hike in the woods, chances are you've walked right by one and didn't even notice it. Now they don't look like much, do they? And you have to speed up the footage to see them move. But let's stop right here for a moment. You see that ant right there? That ant is made up of about 20 million cells. The slime mold that it's standing on, you know how many cells that is? One. It's a single huge cell. And there's bigger ones too. Some species can get up to three feet across. Now you've seen big cells before. The yolk of an egg is a single cell, for example. But I think you'd agree that the yolk of an egg can't exactly fend for itself. But unlike the yolk of an egg, these single-celled plasmodial slime molds can do all sorts of things, including solving problems that humans have a hard time solving. People go to universities to study them. But before we get to the incredible abilities of this smart snot, let's start from the beginning. This right here is sort of like a slime mold kindergarten. Slime molds aren't molds, but at this stage of their life, they resemble them because they start off as spores. And right here, there are thousands of spores. Yes, the snail is eating them, so kind of a bummer. But the babies who aren't getting murdered will be dispersed out into the world by the wind or passing insects. Whoa, <laughs> that ant was spring-loaded. When the spore hatches, what comes out is one of these little jiggly things, a single-celled amoeba just around the size of the point of a pin. And they're cute. Look, this one looks happy. One of those two little googly eyes there is a nucleus. Just a refresher, inside the nucleus, there's these little scrolls of DNA called chromosomes. And written on them is like a book of spells to make all the parts of a slime mold. Somewhere on those squiggles, there's a recipe for mucus. Our nuclei have the same thing. Different spells, but written in the same language. It's not pretty. Here, I'll read you some. Got kuka to kuka at, ataka kukugut, ataka to kuka akakata. And I'll stop right there. If I read the whole thing, you might grow an extra eyeball. Anyway, these little amoebae have some cool spells. If you put them in water, they get all long and grow these flagella. Helps them move and catch food. Look at that, they're little shapeshifters. And when it gets dry again, they can transform right back into that amoeba shape, which always looks like it's been dropped from a great height. Little moving splat. To eat, it just sort of surrounds food and pulls little bubbles into its body. Now, if one of these amoebae meets another one that's sexually compatible, they skip the dating and move right in together. The two cells fuse, and their nuclei fuse too. Now you got two sets of spells in there. You can imagine the arguments. But so far, it's the same as how we do it. A sperm cell fuses with an egg cell and the nuclei fuse, and then we start to grow. But here's the difference. When we grow, our cells divide. To make one cell into two, first the nucleus makes a copy of all of its chromosomes. Then those copies pull apart, and the whole cell sort of pinches itself off. Now you got yourself two cells, each one with a nucleus that has all the chromosomes. Well, slime molds don't care about all that, they do it their own way. Look at this, when their nuclei divide, the cell doesn't divide with them. And now you got yourself a cell with two nuclei, the nerve, and then they do it again, at the same time too, like little synchronized swimmers. See, look at them. And it keeps going, and you know where that's headed, a whole bunch of nuclei, and pretty soon you got yourself a huge cell. All those nuclei start making these proteins that have the ability to link up, and when they do, they start forming these tubes. The proteins are the same ones we have in our muscles, and so the tubes can contract. And if one part contracts, then its neighbors do too. And that creates these pulsing waves that travel through the slime mold, pushing all this liquidy stuff through these throbbing tubes. And the whole thing's got a rhythm to it. First everything flows one way, and then it turns right around and flows the other way. And this back and forth business is why they look like they're breathing when you speed them up. The pressure from these tubes can push the leading edge of a slime mold outwards. Two steps forward, one step back. This species, for example, Physarum polycephalum, creates these little fan fingers that play touchy-touchy with the world. Remember, there's no brain controlling all of this. More like patterns of contractions. If you put an eyedrop of food stank in front of it, those patterns change. The tubes in that area start going crazy, and the whole cell sort of reorganizes, pulling material away from the useless tubes and pumping up the ones that are connected to the num-nums. And all that pressure pushes the slime mold in that direction. All right, simple enough. The booger can move towards food. But food isn't always plopped right in front of you in nature. So what happens when a science hippie blocks the beeline with one of these barriers? So the problem here is that if the slime mold just keeps moving to where the food signal is stronger, it'll get stuck. But slime mold don't get stuck. 
You know why? Because it knows where it's already been. You know in the fairy tales when they leave breadcrumbs behind? It's like that, but instead of breadcrumbs, it's mucus. The slime mold leaves behind a film of snot, sort of an external map of where it's been. The mucus kind of cancels out the food signal, and it tries a new direction. Using this strategy, it can solve a maze. But what's amazing, kill me, is that the solution it settles on tends to be the shortest path through the maze. If you put food down in a bunch of different places, it finds the overall shortest path between all of them. Remember, we're talking about a single cell with no brain. Some science hippies in Japan were like, all right, if you're so smart, try and design a whole railway system. They put food on a map at each train destination and plopped a slime mold right on top of Tokyo. Think very low-budget Godzilla movie. The slime mold did its thing, but then they realized that it had made paths right through a lake and over some mountains. So they did it clever. They created a surface that let light through where there were natural obstacles on the map. Slime molds hate light. It hurts them, so they avoided those areas. On that surface, the slime mold created this network. And here is the actual radar system. When they looked at the slime mold's solution in terms of how much it would cost, how quick you could get places, and how it did if a part of it broke, it did just as well as the one that the peoples made, without all the college debt. I mean, they're very efficient hunters, aren't they? And they're hungry. Oh, that's nasty. <laughs> but don't worry, they won't nibble on your toesies, I don't think, because they're picky. They like protein and some carbs, they avoid the salt, hence the no-no on the pepperoni, and they love the oat flakes. Heart-healthy diet, really. Sure, they might have a cheat day now and then, but who doesn't? If you give them a little buffet, where none of the food has their preferred ratio of proteins to carbs, they'll blend two food sources to the right proportions. Remember how I told you they avoid salt, right? Well, that can change. If you make them crawl across a salt bridge to get their food, eventually they get used to it, and they'll start crawling on a salt surface like nobody's business. It's a kind of learning, isn't it? But here's the crazy part. Slime molds can fuse with other slime molds. The veins just kind of merge into each other. Ooh, that's satisfying. But here's the kicker. If a slime mold that has learned to crawl over salt merges with one that hasn't, it passes on that knowledge. Look at this. The one in the middle was never trained to crawl over salt. But after fusing with two that were, it's the first one to cross the salt bridge. They can transfer friggin' knowledge to each other. It's like a Vulcan mind meld. These abilities allow slime molds to cope with all the crazy things that nature throws at them. If it gets too cold or too dry, they can dry out too. They go into a dormant state called a sclerotium. If you just add some water and food, these come back to life again, and they're right back to it. And that goes on until one day they're big enough and the conditions are right to make the babies. The nuclei, which have divided and divided and now can be in the millions, go through one final division. But this time, instead of making an exact copy of themselves, they divide up their genetic material and give half to one and half to the other. The resulting nuclei encase themselves into a little tough shell, a spore, like a baby in a basket. The spores are often woven into intricate lattices and beautiful structures, studded with all those little fruits. And the rest of the slime mold finally has a chance to shine. Each species does it in their own way. Some raise their little babies up in the air on little stalks. Others create shag carpets of beautifully tangled fuzz. For the insects, whole forests emerge and bloom, and they walk under iridescent baubles and furry little plumes, all of which slowly dry out and crumble as the little babies are carried away by the wind. Or they get eaten by a snail. It's less of an inspirational ending that way. It's more of a slaughter, really. I mean, that's what you get when you're slower than a snail, isn't it? 